Very good evening, everybody. Welcome to part one of Exploring Trading Opportunities in CME Grains and Oil Seeds, a two-part webinar series held in collaboration with CME. I'm Ming Hui from Philip Futures, and speaking to us today will be professional proprietary trader, Mr. David Ng. He will be sharing with us an overview of the agricultural futures markets, fundamental factors that affect prices, some simple trading strategies, and more. But before I pass this on to David, I'd just like to inform you that if you have any questions um, throughout the course of the webinar, please feel free to drop them into the questions box as we will have a Q&A session towards the end. And now, without further ado, let's have David speak to us. Hi, Minghui. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it's great to be uh, on this platform. And I just, firstly, just like to thank uh, CME as well as Philip Futures for hosting this webinar session today. Uh, as what Minghui mentioned, uh, this is going to be a first part series of a two part series, where in the first part, we're going to uncover some of the opportunities, uh, especially in trading in the greens market. Uh, with special emphasis on corn and soybean market, and I think in this in this series uh, I'll be talking more about uh, some of the fundamental perspective as well as technical uh, perspective into how you can start your trading, in, especially into the greens market. So just before I start, a usual disclaimer: um, anything I materials here I present are mainly purely for educational purpose. Um, so any recommendation, do take it with a pinch of salt. Um, do do make your own research and your uh, your own recommendations. Um, so materials are purely presented on educational purpose. So I just want to start off with um, just to give you an overview on how the CME grains market has been performing throughout the year. Um, especially as we as you have known, we are going into a very unprecedented year. Uh, we are definitely in a pandemic crisis. Um, so I think CME, uh, if you look at some of the grains market, especially with corn and soybean, including wheat as well to a certain extent, has been performing relatively very well as compared to other uh, asset classes um, and we're going to explore some of the reasons that underline such an impressive price, price performance uh, for this uh, subgroups of agricultural products and on top of that i think being trade if you're trading in the market especially when you trade agriculture products um, fundamental perspective is always good to have uh, it's always good to trade with a fundamental lens and obviously to make your trading decisions on whether it's on your entry on your exit basis you can always rely on technical uh, but coupled with that fundamental uh, do play an important role especially when trading agriculture products because uh, prices do tend to display a little bit of seasonality pattern and certain patterns tend to repeat itself um, i just want to share with you some simple trading strategy especially when when we're trading the corn and soybean market uh, if you're currently trading in the market uh, you know uh, it's good to always uh, be, be open to different type of trading strategies. If you're new to the market, hopefully um, the session I shared today will probably, uh, will probably able to assist you to kickstart your trading journey, especially in the greens market. And last but not least, I'm going to uh, share with you some of the contract specs, uh, especially for corn and soybean futures as that's available on the CME exchange. So just before I start, some simple facts about corn. So corn and soybean represent the grains, uh, which is you know, uh, uh, food mainly contribute to the food uh, that we normally consume on a daily basis. Um, so corn, I think majority of it are mainly for food consumption. Uh, but over the years, we have seen corn, uh, the demand for corn has actually been shifted from a pure consumption basis uh, right, right through the demand and energy space. Um, so obviously ethanol, uh, ethanol which is, comprises a very heavy demand for corn, uh, comprises probably about 30 to 40% 40, 40 of the total uh, corn demand. And obviously ethanol is always linked to crude oil price. And this year we have seen a slump in crude oil price. In fact, we have seen prices went into negative territory. Um, so definitely that's going to have an impact in terms of corn demand for ethanol. And besides that, we've also seen uh, you know, animal feed uh, being your hog demand and uh, some of them are channeled into uh, making the syrups and sweeteners. Uh, those demand has quite robust in recent in recent months, um, despite we have seen recovery in some of the major economies. So obviously these are all related to the demand perspective uh, and it all related to your food demand uh, in general. Um, so you know if you look at the corn dynamics, majority of the corn in the world is actually being planted in US. Um, and right second to that is China, but 
and um, China's supply has been quite stagnant for a couple of years. So the US is still a very dominant player in terms of the corn supplies. So if you want to trade uh, based on the supply dynamics, you must understand that US is a, plays a very major role, uh, especially in the corn market. Now, going into soybean. Now, soybean, you know, if you look at it, um, most of the soybean uh, function is actually being crushed into soybean meal and soybean oil. So 98% of soybean is actually being used for animal feed, and soybean oil is obviously used for uh, cooking oil uh, on top of your other vegetable oil, like your rapeseed or sunflower seed or even palm oil, for, um, for example. Um, now, and obviously, I think a uh, majority of it is used in animal feed. It's very little of that com composition is actually based on uh, its use for human consumption. So again, I think if you look at the supply dynamics, soybean is uh, soybean producing countries are mainly US, followed by Brazil and Argentina. So the North American and the South American countries are con contributing probably about 80 to 90% of the total world soybean supply. So in fact, if you look at supply dynamics, US still pretty much a dominant player, especially in these two spaces. Um, so if you want to look at into supply dynamics, it's very crucial for us to watch how the supply of corn and soybean is being, uh, being played out in these respective countries. So just to share with you some overview of the grain prices that's been before, uh, throughout the year. So obviously, I've seen a slump in prices uh, back in early March where majority of the countries were trying to uh, fend off uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have seen countries going to lockdown and that actually caused a that actually disrupted some of the crucial demand. We have seen prices uh, went into a bearish territory, uh, but the key thing is that the recovery in terms of price was actually quite sharp. Um, as we head on to April, May, June, we are slowly starting to see economies are starting to try to reopen, and that's where demand start to come in. Uh, now, what shockingly was that in the past couple months, especially going into September and October period, you have seen rallies in the corn and soybean prices. I think this was mainly attributed to uh, production. And on top of that, we're also seeing stronger demand coming from China. So coupled with this fundamental perspective, um, it boils very well into the rally that we're seeing uh, right now in terms of both the corn prices as well as the soybean prices. So now this list is not exhaustive. Um, basically, it just gives you uh, some of the key fundamental factors that can actually affect your green prices. So obviously supply and demand dynamics plays a crucial role. Um, so understanding the overall supply, the overall demand dynamics uh, do give you an upper hand in terms of how the trend or the price trend is going to play out uh, for the respective greens market. Now, if you are looking into fundamental perspective, stock levels are a crucial number which a lot of, a lot of traders or even those in the market are watching. Um, obviously when you have low stock levels, it's always price positive. It's always something good for the prices. When you have high stock levels, then obviously that's going to be very, it's going to put a lot of downward pressure on prices. Um, crop progress. Now, crop progress, you know, if you if you really into uh, looking into some of the key reports, crop progress is actually one of the reports that is actually worth to pay more attention to. Now, um, I think in the next slides, in the next couple of slides, I'll share with you some, uh, some of the key um, thematics, especially when you look into the harvesting cycle and the planting cycle for the North America and the South America, both these countries have different crop cycle altogether. So crop progress are very relevant, especially when you head over to the planting season. Um, so every week, you know, uh, the US uh, USDA will come out with a report uh, on the weekly progress for respective corn and soybean, or in fact, including wheat as well. So if any of those uh, report indicates uh, something, it could be a weather, it could be uh, whether disruption you know, or it could be a slow planting progress that could affect prices. So crop progress is something that's quite crucial to watch on a weekly basis uh, because it does affect prices. Um, same goes for planting intentions, which usually will be very, very relevant in early parts of April uh, to May, which corn and so uh, soybean are actually being planted during that time in US. Uh, weather forecast is another key report. Uh, but then again, weather change very abruptly and very dramatic. So price tend to spike, uh, whether it's on the upside or on the downside, especially when, due, uh, especially when it comes to weather changes. And last but not least, government policies do have an impact on prices as well. 
So just going through the crop cycles uh, for the North America and the South American countries. So in US, corn is most of the time is planted during the month of April and May, probably early parts of April. And soybean, on the other hand, probably will start planting around early May. Now, um, when it comes to harvesting cycle, so for corn, it's usually between starts, I think the first to second week of September, right to the end of November. Um, soybean will start probably yeah, with the same time as corn, probably in the first week of September, right to the end of October. Um, wheat, this is hard winter wheat. So probably uh, it will start probably planting around April to June and harvested uh, during the August or September months. Now, if you look at the South American crop cycle, it's the opposite of the US uh, crop cycle. So March to May represents uh, the harvesting months for uh, soybean in Brazil. Argentina is slightly later by a month. They will start probably around April to June. And if you look at it uh, right now, if you, we are moving into November and December towards the fourth quarter of the year, this is where Brazil and Argentina, both the countries are starting to plant their soybeans. That's the reason why we have seen news like uh, Brazil's are showing, indicating slower planting progress due to drought, due to weather issues, and that causes prices to spike. So it's very crucial for us to watch during planting season. Um, and it's even, uh, it's even vital for us to look into the planting progress when we hit into the planting seasons. Now, um, a key report, if you're looking at fundamental uh, perspective, a key report that you have to watch out is always uh, the World Agriculture Supply and Demand Estimates, or in short, the uh, WASI report. In this report, it usually indicates what are the estimates and also the projected numbers. Um, now, if you really get, dig through the numbers, you know, there's a lot of numbers are being displayed. Uh, the key thing is always to look into the yields, which is always to tell you how is the production going to play out, the production trend and pattern, and obviously the stock levels as well. So if you if the report indicate that it's we are probably going to face a lower production, prices will, prices will tend to be supportive. Same goes for stock levels. Um, the reason they are seeing, the, this was in November's report, the latest report, we have seen the stock levels and the yield levels for soybean, it's pretty much, uh, soybean and corn is pretty much below estimates. And that explains why there's a rally, the recent rally in prices. So if you are someone that's looking into uh, the WASI reports is very crucial for you to look at the production pattern and the stock levels. So this was just uh, released, I think, in the November's report. It was released on the November 10th. So you can clearly see uh, the overall report sentiment was bullish. In fact, uh, when the actual numbers came out, it was way below what market expected in terms of um, stock levels and in terms of production trend. So that explains why uh, we can see a sharp rally in both uh, commodities, uh, soybean as well as corn. Um, so if you are someone that's trading a market, it's very crucial for you to take note on when uh, was the report is going to be published. Um, so you know if you want to get to if you, if you are someone that's you know trying to trade over the trend, um, you know you have to be very careful on these publication dates because once those reports are published, those numbers are published, uh, markets will usually make a sharp move, uh, whether it's on counter trend or whether it's on the writing on the trend itself. So it's very crucial for traders to watch out on the publication for WASI report because it does have an impact on markets. Now, going into um, trend of things, if you look at production pattern, um, why was the estimates uh, uh, was so far off? Because I think if you just look at last year before we start, uh, before the COVID crisis actually hit us, um, I think market was projecting that 2020 is a year where we will see a record supply in corn and record supply in soybean, especially in the US, because the planting intentions were high at that time. Um, but then again, it didn't materialize. Um, you, you probably you are seeing production patterns in, especially off late, starting from September onwards, you're starting to see trends are starting to decline. So that explains why price, prices for both soybean and corn are actually quite robust. Um, so obviously, going forward, uh, as we enter to the old crop cycle and going to the next year season, it's crucial to watch what are the intentions like. So if the intentions are still high, probably we're going to see a record uh, production year next year. So therefore, I think prices uh, going forward will probably tend to have a bit of adjustment. Um, and that's where we, we have to put a bit more attention to. 
So now, soybean, top soybean producing countries are US, Brazil, and Argentina. So back in the early 2000s, we clearly see the US leading uh, the space. We can clearly see US producing probably more than 50% of the world's supply of soybean. Uh, but sooner or later, Brazil and Argentina uh, came into the market. They took the lead. And I think right now, uh, in fact, if you just look at these numbers, despite uh, despite the weather issues that they are facing, I think Brazil is probably going to surpass US for the first time uh, in terms of the soybean production. So Brazil and Argentina, the South American beans are starting to get to flood the market uh, with much more quantity. And I think US, in in other words, is probably going to face slower or slower growth in terms of their production uh, going forward. But then again, um, with the rise of China, uh, with recovery in the economy, you know, soybeans demand is going to pick up eventually. Um, so given we have seen growth in Brazil and Argentina, those numbers are still supportive uh, going forward because you know we're going to go into a place or we're going to go to a pace where you're going to see higher demand, and that's well compensated by increase in supply. So corn, uh, pretty much a similar dynamics again. U.S. represent top producing country in the world, uh, followed by China and again Brazil. Um, and if you just look at the trend in Brazil, corn uh, supply coming from Brazil is also quite increasing su quite substantially. So we clearly see that uh, Brazil is trying to leverage uh, on its position, especially on being a top soybean producing uh, country in the world. And corn, followed by corn, which is the next biggest uh, agriculture product for Brazil. Um, so obviously, I think Brazil will, will probably be a very big uh, dominant player in time to come. And therefore, I think the supply dynamics uh, might change in years to come. So this is just a sample of crop uh, weekly progress, which is I highlighted earlier. I think it's, it's crucial to watch. It's, it comes out on every Monday on a weekly basis. It starts from April right to the end of November uh, for soybean and right to the end of December for corn. Um, so it's crucial to watch how the weekly progress is going to play out. If we have probably we have seen uh, prices to react on a weekly basis if those reports uh, are not negative to the counter trend. So you no, know, if you are trading the market, it's very crucial for you to pay attention to these reports because it does have an impact on the market, and it does tells you whether the current trend that we're seeing in the market is sustainable or not. So. Besides low production uh, season or uh, lower than expected production levels, um, stock levels are is even below some of the key estimates uh, that's being forecasted for throughout this year. And that explains why uh, prices tend to be supportive. And in fact, it rarely, uh, it actually broke the two or three, two or three years past trends. Um, so you just look at the numbers alone. Um, you know, this year, I think a lot of people are forecasting that we're going to have a higher supply of corn, but that's not the case. And in fact, if you look at the stock levels, we are looking at the lower stock levels for corn and soybean this year. So it's it's again it's very it's uh, unprecedented uh, due to the strong demand that we're seeing, the recovery they're seeing, and therefore I think prices would just reacted to um, such dynamics. Now, just to highlight. And to emphasize the current stock levels they were seeing. So again, you can clearly see, you know, a lot of market forecasters were predicting that 2020 is going to be a huge supply for corn and soybean. But that's not the case as we enter into September, October period, where China actually gear up their purchase for both commodities, especially for corn, uh, which is quite unusual. Uh, but then again, you know, um, being dynamics in play, whether the question is whether is this sustainable for months to come. It's still questionable, uh, but the momentum they are seeing is is indicating to you that the market is actually going into a form of surplus uh, expectation to a deficit projection. So I think this is where market is is probably trying to factor in the terms of the prices, and but it's crucial to watch as we go into the new crop season next year whether such dynamics can still play out. So. No, a key indicator, a key fundamental indicator when you are trading the agricultural products is always to look at the stocks to use ratio. So basically, this indicator is just to indicate to you um, whether the current stock levels is low enough. So if you have a low number on a stock to use ratio, it's trying to indicate that the carryover stocks is actually on a very low basis. Um, so overall, you have a very stock, very low stock level, and that is actually price positive. 
Now, if you have a very high ratio, that means you know you have a very high carryover stocks, and that will have to carry over forward to the next marketing year. So that again will be price negative. So if you are trading on on this space, it's very important for you to uh, look at some of these key indicators and to see where prices uh, tend to go. Uh, especially, you know, stocks is always a very critical component. Uh, especially when you want to analyze uh, the supply and demand dynamics. So um, another key aspect of uh, which we should pay more attention to is on weather, uh, and you know, weather being very, uh, very dynamic, very volatile. Uh, and in fact, I think if you look look at the past few seasons. Um, in the past couple of months, we have seen reports uh, emerging, especially uh, indicating that you no know, La Nina season is here to come. Or uh, in fact, we are in a La Nina season. So you know, when you have extreme weather extremities like La Nina and El Nino uh, phenomenon, it's going to have impact on prices. Uh, and clearly enough, you know, clear enough, we have seen rally in prices in uh, commodity prices due to the impact of La Nina. So right now, if you look at the crop cycle. Brazil and Argentina is going into planting seasons. So if you have adverse weather conditions like what we are, what they are facing right now, they have dry conditions throughout uh, the major key growing areas in Brazil. Um, so soybean supplies is going to be get affected, and therefore I think market is actually pricing this in, and you know, you know def definitely we going go into the next year with low carryover stocks, and that spells a market deficit. So which is actually price supportive. So again, you know, once this is clear, once weather becomes normal, what will be the impact? Can we see a normalcy in terms of demand and supply? I think that's the question that we should ask ourselves. Okay, so that's pretty, pretty much on the supply basis. Now, if you look at demand dynamics, it's it's again a very bullish picture. So 2020 it, uh, is a year of unprecedented year. We've seen the COVID crisis coming in the picture early part of this year and it actually affected demand. It decimated a uh, huge uh, demand across all greens market. But you know, uh, I think the funny thing is that we have seen a very speedy recovery in most major markets, and including the greens market as well. So soybeans and corn, despite this uh, demand destruction in early part of this year, as we move to the second half of this year, the picture totally changed. And this was actually mainly attributed to strong demand coming from China. And China, as they remove their lockdowns in certain cities, the the demand starts to pick up. So therefore, I think corn and soybean is we are seeing you know huge demand uh, from China this year. Um, now, again, I think this is very abnormal situation. It is again temporal. That means uh, situation can change as we move uh, towards a longer period of time. Um, but it. But just looking at the numbers, it's again tremendous. Again, market are expecting that demand is going to be not lesser, it's going to be sluggish, but that's not what we're seeing in, in the latest reports. So therefore, I think prices justified by the recent rally. Uh, but then again, as we move towards a new marketing year, can China still purchase such a big amount? Um, there's a couple of reasons why China actually purchased more corn and soybean. Um, I think firstly, we have seen a recovery in their own respective economy. And second, I think you know, just last year, they were hit by the Asian swine flu that, that decimated some of their major hog production. As this year, they try to rebuild their hog production, they do need a lot of corn and soybean uh, as part of their feedstock. So we can see there's a replenish cycle that's coming to the picture. So again, that's actually pushing some of the big demand. Um, third, we're also seeing prices in China that's slightly to be on the high side compared to uh, what the US prices are. So I think there's a bit of arbitrage opportunity there. So a lot of traders are actually capturing those arbitrage opportunities. Um, now, ethanol is also obviously contribute a significant demand for corn. We have seen the recovery, the recovery in terms of demand for ethanol. Uh, whether those demand can sustain, I think that's, that's, uh, that's probably of the wait and see. Uh, but I think that lends to the overall stronger demand for corn and soybean in general. Okay, so I think this to reiterate the point, I think China is actually very ramping up their purchases for corn and soybean towards the as we enter towards the fourth quarter of the year. Okay, so again, I think the picture as we've seen early March, uh, you, you probably see the record 
uh, lowest the record low demand for soybean coming from US, especially from China, uh, heading to China destination. But that picture totally reversed as we enter into the May June period, uh, and as we go into the October November December towards the last quarter of the year, demand is still strong. Um, so I think this is what's supporting prices in the near term. And you no. Know, um, I think one of the major reason that is supporting such a huge purchase is that um, China is obviously trying to comply with the trade deal that they've uh, signed with US early part of this year. But obviously, this is this situation is still remain very fluid. We, we are probably going to have a new incoming president, um, so US China trade war dynamic is going to change. Uh, but we can clearly see, I think the phase one trade deal did have a significant impact. Uh, on China demand, especially for U.S. Uh, grains. Uh, so again, I think government policies always plays a very crucial role and it does have an impact on prices. Uh, but this is an area where it's very hard for us to uh, wait to make a projection to, or in, even in fact to base on any historical basis because government policies changes over time. Now, uh, a key tool for those who are trading in the grains market is to look into what we call a report, uh, commitments of traders report, the COT report, which in, the, in this report, it reflects the overall positions of uh, majority of the players in the market. Um, so in COT report, they usually break down into two types of subcategories. One is, we call it the commercial interest and one is the non-commercial interest. So commercial interest usually highlights uh, uh, those, uh, those who are in the market, basically the producers, the processors uh, who needs, who pretty much go into the futures market to probably hedge their own uh, positions. Now, the non-commercial side of things is basically, uh, we call it the mon money managed positions, are those uh, categories of traders who are, are probably are from hedge funds or proprietary traders, or even uh, to a certain class, the retail traders as well. So their, posi their net positions are crucial for us to indicate why their overall position uh, bullishness or bias uh, or bearishness uh, of the market. So they tend to have a bias of the, uh, in the market. So if you just look at this, the corn COT report early part of this year was actually in negative territory, which indicate that majority of uh, the non-commercial traders are in fact very bearish uh, in the market, which is quite in line with prices. We have seen prices uh, early part of this year, um, you know, hitting the low of three dollars uh, on. Uh, on a historical low, but then again, it rebounded probably towards the June, July period. So if you coincide with the COT report, we start to see short interest starts to diminish, which means that um, these traders are starting to close their short positions and starting to turn long. And in fact, right now we are, we are seeing an overall net positive positions in uh, some, uh, in the non-commercial posi non -commercial positions. So that indicates and that supports that the current prevailing trend uh, for the corn market is here to stay. Uh, but do pay attention as you know, as interest starts to diminish, as long position starts to uh, diminish, I think that's usually a sign of uh, trend exhaustion as you know, people will anticipate that the rally might not last and probably there will be a pullback or retracement in terms of prices. So as a trader, I think commitment, uh, COT reports uh, does give a very good indication on where is the overall biasness of the market. So right now we can clearly see the con, uh, con general market bias is still on an uptrend, and still pretty much bullish. But do watch out, um, COT reports uh, published on a weekly basis. Uh, no, do, do note for any change or any diminish in terms of their strength, uh, and especially in terms of open positions. Now, if you look at the soybean side, um, soybean overall, I think this year was actually quite neutral in early part of the year. Uh, things starts to change around the July August period where uh, reports starts to indicate that we're probably going to have a lower supply. So a lot of this money managed money managed positions are starting to increase uh, their overall long positions. Um, so off late we have seen uh, a little uh, the, we have seen those positions starts to diminish, which indicate that the trend uh, might be a bit exhaustive. Um, those who are holding long probably have could have exited the market. So I think this COT report. Uh, will give you an indication whether the market is actually on a bullish phase uh, or whether it's on a bullish bias or it's a bearish bias. So overall net positions, um, you can clearly see, I think this year we start off the year uh, with slightly negative for corn, 
neutral for soybean, but both this commodity has picked for an upturn uh, towards the July-August period, where you know, those numbers that's coming in are actually very supportive for prices. Um, so if you are trading on the market, it's very crucial for us to watch uh, the COT report in detail. So you know, being in a uh, commodity market, seasonality is very crucial as historical uh, if you just look at historical uh, price performance they tend to have a pattern in terms of uh, the price performance so if you look at the breakdown from january to december um, if you notice red boxes usually indicates that a month-to-month -month change is negative and green boxes is basically to indicate the month-to-month -month, uh, change is, posit is positive so you know you do notice that you know, towards the year end and towards the first quarter is where usually we see prices tend to be stronger. Uh, this is in line with you know the, the harvesting cycle uh, for corn and soybean. Now, one thing to take note is that June, July, August is where you know uh, periods where it's slightly more on the negative side. And if you look at the price fluctuation, it tends to be very volatile in those periods. The reason being is because June, July, August is usually the planting season for corn and soybean in US. So as you no know, weekly progress comes in, and you know, if anything that deviates from the average market expectation, prices will definitely react. So if you are trading in this space, you are, if you are trading both the commodities, it's very important for you to take note uh, which are the periods that's very volatile. And again, which are the periods that you know, tend to display stronger price performance and periods where tend to display an, a weaker price performance. So seasonality is based on historical, and we just we are just writing on an assumption that historicals do repeat. Uh, but then again, I think if you just look at this month itself, for the month of November this year, uh, we are seeing strong price performance that was attributed to lower yields, uh, weather issues, and stronger demand. So you know it's actually bucking the historical trend. So it's, this is something that's uh, crucial to watch if you are just purely based on historical. Uh, data or performance, you know, it might not uh, give you an accurate picture. So do take with a pinch of salt, but give, take it as a guideline for you to trade uh, you know, uh, whenever you're approaching a new monthly season. Now, this for soybean, 20-year price seasonality. And if you just look at it, um, again, July, August, September is usually very volatile. And again, it's a very critical period. Uh, because soybean, those periods are also coincide with the planting season for soybean. And again, you look at it, the first quarter, the January, February months are usually very strong. Uh, they tend to dis display a stronger price performance. So if you are trading uh, based on historical trend, you know, these are the couple of months that you, you have to be aware of. So um, I've covered the fundamental perspective on, uh, on trading basically the grains market, the corn and soybean. Uh, and now I'm moving to the technical perspective. Um, so being a trader, you know, technical always provides you an opportunity for you to execute a decisions on quite a timely basis. Because if you look, if you want to wait for a report, you know, probably you need to wait on a one week gap because the next report is going to be out in the next week. If like you look at uh, the Wazir report, which is only out on a monthly basis, then you will wait almost a month. And in between those periods, trading periods, prices tend to change accordingly. So technical perspectives will give you a bit more allowance. It allows you to you know, uh, time your entry and exit in a much more promptly manner. So I think first thing is we need to establish whenever we, we want to trade on a technical perspective is to establish the overall trend of the particular product. Uh, and to do that is here what I use is always to look into the 200 EMA line. EMA stands for exponential moving average. So if you look at the EMA line, if those candles are below the 200 EMA line is indicating that the market is actually bearish because 200 EMA lines probably could coincide about uh, six months of trading periods, which is quite sufficient in, in when you're trading greens uh, products. And if you look at uh, uh, candles that's above the line or crossing the line uh, on the upside, it's indicating the market is actually pointing you on a bullish face. So the 200 EMA line is, is a good indication to indicate for you the overall trend of the market. So as long as the candles are below the line, it's indicating that the overall trend is still negative. And if those candles are above the line, it's indicating to you that the market is actually on a bullish phase. And on top of that, I think the 200 EMA line acts also as a support and a resistance level 
for particular price. Uh, so a lot of traders are watching this and it's a very good indication for you to establish a particular trend for a particular product. Now, having a 200 EMA line uh, just to establish a trend uh, may, may, may not be suffice to give you a trading decision. So obviously you need a couple uh, the 200 EMA line with other indicators, other technical indicators. So as for my end, um, I, I always use Heiken Ashi, which is uh, one type of candles, Japanese candlesticks, which is slightly different from your normal Japanese candlesticks. Now, the main difference is your normal Japanese candlesticks has thousands over patterns. In Heiken Ashi, which is based on a mathematical formula, which you can get it, you can Google it if you want to know in depth uh, you know, about this Heiken Ashi. Um, it's based on the arithmetic mathematical formula, which takes the average of your normal Japanese candlesticks bar. Uh, why? Now, the reason I chose candle, uh, Heiken Ashi over Japanese candlesticks is that if I want to see the trend, uh, Heiken Ashi tend to display a clearer picture as compared to the Japanese candlesticks. And Japanese candlesticks, you need to take the trouble to identify certain patterns because uh, if you just look at you know uh, some of the key uh, Japanese candlesticks pattern, it has various and um, the setups, it, it has multiple types of uh, patterns. So it's very difficult for you to identify and for you to make a trading decisions. So Heiken Ashi in certain ways is clearer. Uh, and obviously, if you look at uh, Japanese candlesticks, there's always gaps in between prices. Uh, if you look at Heiken Ashi, it closes up the gap because again, Heiken Ashi is just an average uh, bar for the Japanese candlesticks. So that's, you don't see any gaps, but that will be represented by a colored bar. So in a way, it's giving you a clearer direction of the overall trend at that present time as compared to Japanese candlesticks. So there's three distinct patterns in Heiken Ashi. Uh, obviously, Japanese candlesticks has thousands of different patterns, but Heiken Ashi, there's only three distinct patterns. Um, so you need to recognize uh, those bars if you have you no. Know, the first bar on as shown here is you just have a bar with a uh, with the tail end. Those are indicating uh, the normal price range. And if you have a bars with have very short can very short tails, those will indicate a strong uh, bullish or bearish trend. And if you if you look at Japan's candlesticks, you have a doji which indicates a very long tail ends but very short body. This also applies in Heiken actually. So that usually indicates this trend, uh, the momentum starts to decline, that possible there'll be a trend change. So let's put into perspective. Um, so you can clearly see on the left side, this is an uptrend. Uh, if you can see those green bars getting bigger and wider, the bodies are getting bigger. So whenever the body of the candle gets wider, that means the trend and momentum of the price is strong. So green bars indicates to you it's an uptrend. And if you see a, on vice versa, if you see a red bar, big body, that usually indicates a downtrend. Now, if you see you know, small little bodies, but long tails, like a dodgy pattern, um, that usually indicates that the market is actually on, on, on a side range or uh, side range market with no clear direction of where the overall trend is. So he can actually, in you know, certain ways, it illuminates um, you know, where the overall trend direction is in, in, the, clearer, uh, in the clearer picture. Now, so besides moving average, I also use a uh, EMA, and I just highlighted earlier, I use a 200 EMA to establish a trend. And I do couple the 200 EMA with other uh, short, shorter term EMA uh, time parameter because that will probably give me, uh, give me an easier entry and exit. Uh, now, there's a lot of moving at different type of moving averages that's available on a, a most charting platforms. Uh, obviously, the common ones are simple moving average, which just take the aromatic formula of just calculating av the averages of your prices. Exponential is slightly different calculation. It gives a lot of weightage on your current price. So in other words, exponential moving average uh, reacts uh, in a much more sensitive manner as compared to your simple moving average. And therefore signals are faster as compared to uh, your SMEs. So the time of parameter that I use in trading the greens market is I use a 9 days EMA, uh, 45 days EMA and the 20 days EMA. So I have a short term trend, a medium term trend and a long term trend. So um, now you can, this 
parametric that I use, it varies uh, accordingly, but it has been back tested uh, and it does give uh, quite a re 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 reasonable and quite reliable signal over time. But then again, market dynamics always change. Uh, again, you have to tweak it around. Uh, those numbers, you have to tweak it, those numbers, um, you know, as to fit to the current dynamics of the market. Um, so based on this parametric that I use, uh, so EMA is simple to establish. Whenever you see a crossover, which is the shorter term crossing those medium and longer term uh, MAs usually indicate uh, it's a bullish crossover. And that usually uh, indicates a buy signal. So that accompanied by Haken Ashi candles, we show you a lot of green candles, which is showing you an uptrend. That usually be a sign that for you to enter the market. So with that, I think we can establish uh, you can use Haken Ashi combining with your EMAs to give you a clearer uh, entry position. So this is an example on the soybean example. Again, this is a bullish crossover. You can clearly see the shorter term MA, which is your nine days MA highlighted by the blue line crossing over your medium term and the longer term EMAs. Uh, Haken Ashi is also pointing your green candle. That means the market is ripe for a bullish trend. So that indicates your entry uh, methodology. Obviously, with every trades that you perform, you do have to have a stop loss in mind. Uh, and you know, again, you know, to be long in this business, stop loss is very crucial because it protects your capital. Um, and I think one of the key indicator that I always uh, use to establish my stop loss level is what we call the average true range. Now this uh, indicator seek to take uh, the price difference, the high and low, whether it's on a daily basis, or on an hourly basis, based on the time parameter that you set, it gives you the range. So, you know, if you're trading on a daily basis, uh, the volatility of a soybean market, let's say the ETI value is 10 cents. So that means, you know, you, you have to prepare to take a loss of 10 cents. Uh, and obviously it depends on your risk to reward ratio that you set for yourself. Uh, if you run on a risk to reward ratio of two to one, that means, you know, Every 10 cents that you risk, you must be prepared to uh, take your profit at 20 cents uh, level because it's a two to one ratio. So I think ATI gives you uh, a gauge on how the market volatility is. And the wider the volatility is, obviously your stop loss has to be set even wider. Um, so I think ATI gives you a ground basis on how you're going to set your stop loss. And by establishing that, you know, you're able to not every trade is going to be a successful trade. There's bound to trades where you know you get you tend to get stopped out. Um, so I think it's again I like to reiterate the point: if you're trading in the market for a longer term basis, it's very crucial for you to establish a stop loss level. And I think ATR is presents you a very good uh, platform for you to establish a specific stop loss level. So just to put uh, just to bring into example, so this is on soybean example on a thirty minutes time frame. Um, so I can see there's a, you know, uh, Haken Energy is on, on a green uptrend and green candle indicates that it's possible of an uptrend. And my ATR right now is showing me as a three cents. So obviously I enter at the current price, I have to put a stop loss three cents below and target profit is two to one ratio. I'm probably going to target a six cents profit. So that's how I be using ATR for me to gauge uh, where should my, where should I place my stop loss level. So um, I, I, that's pretty much on the technical perspective, a simple technical setup that you can use to trade the greens, uh, the greens market. Um, obviously you can trick those parameters along the way and you can back test it uh, based on historical data. Um, but importantly is that you know, market is always dynamic. Uh, situation is very fluid. So you know, certain parameters may not be applicable for a period of time. Then you have to tweak those uh, parameters along the way. So I'm just going to give you a general overview on how I see the market, uh, especially for corn and soybean. Um, now soybean, if you look at the fundamental perspective, it looks like, you know, rally is going to sustain for a while. Um, you know, it crossed the major $10 level. It's, it's a very strong psychological resistance. It managed to cross that, that tells you that the market is actually quite bullish. Um, and by then again, you know, as uh, I always emphasize, you know, stories, fundamental picture will change moving time. So going forward, um, whether 
China demand is going to be that resilient. Uh, supply is not going to be that affected much as we head over to next year. Uh, I think weather is not going to be a very important player. Uh, by then again, weather can change anytime. So I, I think given that normalcy, we should see a price retracement. Uh, but if you just look at levels, uh, I think $12 is a very strong psychological resistance or swipe in. Uh, I think it, it can break that, but you know, if it does break that, again, I think $12.60 is the next resistance, which I think is, it will be very hard to cross uh, in, in my opinion. So I think with that in mind, I think you know, soybean overall is still pretty much an uptrend. Corn on the other hand, you know, if you look at historical perspective, uh, the $3 is always what we call the market uh, cost level, which is also indicating the production cost uh, to produce corn in general. So the $3 has always been a very strong support for many years. And obviously we have crossed the $4 mark. Uh, now we are probably approaching the $5 mark. Um, but again, there's a lot of resistance on the $5 mark. Even the 480 level is also pretty pretty strong resistance over there. Um, but corn is on a bullish phase. If you look at the fundamentals, it's showing you lower stocks. Demand is still pretty much resilient, very robust. Um, so I, I think corn in general, we still see a bit of uptrend. But I think 480 is where the uh, level that we should be watching out. Uh, if it does cross that, I think that's uh, $5 shouldn't be an issue. No, so corn is still pretty much still an upside, but these two commodities should have a retracement in coming weeks or months. So now to get things started, you know, um, soybean, corn, uh, obviously we didn't touch on wheat today, uh, but if you look at if you, the fundam fundamental perspective is pretty much the same for the wheat market as well. Um, if you're trading a wheat, you, you do have to pay attention to all those reports I just mentioned. Um, now, if you look at the margins itself, one dollar of soybean is about two thousand US dollars. Corn is probably half of that. Um, and if you just look at the tick size, is you know a quarter of a cent is twelve equivalent to twelve dollar and fifty cents. So, uh, uh, one cent movement is going to be a fifty US dollars move. Um, I think the time period is actually very. Uh, it's almost sixteen hours market. It's giving you, you know, consideration both the Asian and uh, US markets. Um, so it, it gives a lot of exposure to traders. You know, you, you want to get exposed during the Asian hours. You're more comfortable doing doing the Asian hours. You know, uh, I think soybean is quite active during the Asian hours as well. Then obviously the night market is you know it's very relevant to pay more attention uh, to the U.S. side of things, especially with the release of certain reports. So I think um, those will play a crucial role as you move into the U.S. Uh, night cycle uh, markets. So I think average volume has been uh, quite robust. Obviously, July, October period, we've seen the rally in prices. Uh, that also tend, uh, tend amount to increase in overall volume. Uh, but I think average volume has been actually very decent. And you know, if you are trading the market, there, there will be no issue of liquidity at all. Now, I'm just going to bring attention to a new contract that's actually being uh, uh, launched by CME. I, I, think this is, I think it was launched probably in uh, early parts of October uh, this year. So it's basically the South American soybean futures. Um, I think this is you know mainly to cater the rise of South America's uh, soybeans. You know, as I indicated earlier, Brazil is now a dominant player in the soybean space. So obviously, there is always uh, whether you are you are in the market, you know, you definitely need to hedge your position with a more relevant uh, market, which is you know Brazil being a very major player uh, in this commodity space. Um, so I think you know uh, such contracts are actually quite timely. You know, if you're new to if you're new to market, you can obviously have a look at it. Uh, you can go to the cmegroup.com website and you can have a more detailed uh, info on this product. So with that, um, I probably come to my end of my presentation. Uh, just before I go to the Q&A, I just want to end it with a quote. So if you are trading in a market or you're a full-time trader, no, I, I, I'm not sure whether you read any of the one tap book, but you know, one tap is always uh, one of the trader that, uh, that I really admire. So, you know, what he says is that a peak performance trader is totally committed to being the best and doing whatever it takes to be the best. So he feels totally responsible for whatever happens and can learn from mistakes. So these people typically have a working business plan for trading because they treat trading as a business. Um, so with that, um, 
you know, I'm going to pass it over to Minghui for the Q&A. Okay, thank you, David. Moving right on to the Q&A segment, our first question of the night is, from a technical perspective, could you demonstrate how to do intraday trading for agricultural futures? And which entry and exit signal or technical indicator would you use? Okay, yeah. Um, thank you for the question. I think it's a very great question. Um, if you just go back to a couple of sites where I just presented earlier. Um, now, the 200 EMA is more more to indicate the overall trend. So, you can actually, I always, if you want to trade on an intraday basis, you have to reduce your time frame. So the time frame here that I established is 30 minutes time frame. You can in, in fact go uh, probably to 15 minutes, but 15 minutes, the problem of going down to a smaller time frame is that you you have you tend to have a lot of mixed signals. Um, so to avoid that, you probably need to go to on a higher time frame. Oh, so 30 minutes is actually sufficient on an intraday basis. So look for Haken Ashi candles to point you that there's a strong uptrend or downtrend indicated by uh, the body of the candles itself, followed by um, your exponential moving average. The parametric that I use is 9, 20, and 45. Um, in fact, you can use 9 and 20. Uh, 45 is just a bit more longer term. Uh, if, you want, if, if you want your signals to be even faster, then you have to move your time parameter, the days of moving average into smaller days. Uh, but I think by doing that, you tend again, you tend to have a lot of mixed signals uh, and you know, to avoid that you probably need to put it on a slightly longer time frame uh, so that's how i probably will do on a day trading basis okay so for our next question uh, our audience would like to know if you can share your trading time frame and if you use high frequency data in your trading okay um just to disclaim um I, I'm not using a high frequency data. Uh, the time frame that I use is only 30 minutes on the intraday basis. Uh, then, uh, but then again, uh, I still look into uh, the longer perspective, which means I, I in fact look into a daily and weekly basis. Um, so if it necessitate me to hold a certain position for a longer period of time, I do do that. Uh, but intraday basis, 30 minutes is again, like I say, is sufficient. Uh, so you, you can stagger it up, you can look at the 30 minutes is your lowest time frame, you move it up to probably an hour, four hours and daily. So that's how you, you probably see the overall uh, price dynamics. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is if you can also share with us your daily preparation plan before you begin your working day. Okay, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, Hopefully the the person who asked is actually a, a full-time trader. Uh, wow, the preparation is is uh, because I trade um a few markets. I just I don't trade the just the greens market alone. I also trade the financial products as well. Um, so obviously trading commodities is slightly different play from trading financial futures. Um, so preparation will usually involves you know um pre-market normally you look at news, you look at your pre-plan. Basically, what happened overnight? Um, you know, if you are trading on soybean, you you have to know which reports are out. So this week, if if I have a very big major report like the World Agriculture Supply Demand Estimates, I I'm gonna be very careful. Um, you know whether why I want to take such a risk to trade on that day. So you know, pre-plan will always involve uh will always involve what what are your pers perspective in terms of uh reports that's coming out. You know, news that's there's news that's flowing in the market. And obviously you have to look at the charts, you have pre-planned where is your entry and exit. And obviously where is your stop loss levels are. Uh, post plans, uh, once after trading is always a review uh, and you know, to see where are the areas that you can improve and where there are areas that you can uh, continue to work on. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question is, what do you think is the biggest variable for soybean and soybean oil for Q1 2021? Wow. Um, well, for soybean, uh, 2021 next year, it's uh, crucial to see how um, supply of South American beans is going to come in. Um, as you see, the crop cycle 
um, first quarter is usually the supply of South America beans coming into the market. Um, so it's crucial to watch those numbers. If those numbers are below estimates, you know, probably you know, we still see prices tend to be supportive. Um, soybean oil is basically a buy factor of soybean. Uh, obviously, we have seen uh, high soybean prices means higher demand for soybean, which translate into higher demand for crushing. So therefore, we sh should translate to higher prices of soybean oil. Uh, now, soybean oil perspective is always as a cooking oil. Um, you know, again, it also depends on the variable like other vegetable oil, especially your palm oil uh, or even other vegetable oils. Um, so, but, but then again, um, the way I look at it, uh, coming first quarter, it's crucial to see the supply demand dynamics again, especially coming from South America. Uh, soybean oil perspective will probably lend some support from soybean uh, as a whole. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is, do you see a correlation between crude oil, crude oil, crude palm oil and soybean oil? Can we trade off this relationship? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, in fact, I get that a lot. Um, now, if you're trading, if you're trading a commodity spaces, uh, especially the soybean complex, uh, both have a very strong uh, correlation. Uh, obviously, both have different fundamental factors. Uh, but if you just look, just look at recent price performance for both commodities, you, you can clearly see that you, know, uh, you have seen the rally in soybean, rally in soybean oil pushing uh, or rather lifting up the sentiment in the palm oil segment as well. Uh, both actually are quite correlated. Uh, again, it, is, it share a very uh, similarity in terms of their fundamental factors. Um, you know, as, as you demand more soybean, means you, you have higher consumption of your vegetable oil as well. Uh, that also should translate to higher palm oil prices as well. Um, so I think it, it has a very um, strong positive correlation. So if you are trading both markets, it's very important for you to take note how the price performance is going to play out. So since palm oil trades from you know uh, mainly on the Asian hours and soybean it could be traded right across the night market, uh, whatever happens in soybean oil uh, overnight could have an impact on the opening price for palm oil the next day. So as a trader, you have to be uh, accustomed to that. Uh, there's always a price relationship, which is positive. Um, and you know, in what our market terms, we always call the, we call it the palm oil, soybean oil spread. Uh, there's a spread to it. There's a historical average. The historical average is hundred US dollars. Um, so you no, know, if if the average go, the average price goes above those average, it indicates usually indicates that you know either one of the product is is underperforming one's old performing. Um, so if you are trading on that space, I think you know, this are relationship between both products that you need to be aware of. Okay, thank you, David. Um, uh, due to time constraint, we will select one last question for tonight. And that is how much of your trading strategy is discretionary and how much of it is quantitative, which is preferred for agricultural contracts? <sighs> Wow, this is a very good question as well. Um, it, I I don't really fix a percentage. Uh, but I would say majority of the trading decision is still very discretionary based. Um, we because I'm trading as a proprietary trader, uh, as a proprietary desk. Uh, we are slowly moving into quantitative trading. Um, uh, you know, those are I, I would say if you want to give me a percentage, um. Uh, probably 10 to 15% of our total trades are more on quantitative sites. Uh, it's still very, discretion trading is still pretty much a very big portion of our overall trades. All right, thank you very much for the insights, David. Uh, we have received an overwhelming number of questions. And for those who didn't manage to answer tonight, we will do so via email. So thank you, David, and thank you very much, everybody, for your time tuning into this webinar tonight. We will thank also you. be sending everyone a link to today's webinar so you can watch it again if you would like to. Yep. So do visit our website, philipfutures.com.sg or .my if you would like to reach out to us or indicate in the post-webinar survey if you would like for us to reach out to you. That's all for today. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Okay, thank you.